Okay. Yeah, so I welcome all of you to the last session of the fourth day of this conference. So the first speaker in this session is Rudranil Basu from Wits Goa. He is going to talk about Carolian field theories. Okay, so over to Rudranil. You have half an hour and uh, five minutes for discussion, 25 minutes for the talk, and I will remind you just five minutes before that. That means after 20 minutes of your time. So you can okay. thank you. Sir. I'm sharing my screen, yes. Okay, uh, first of all, I thank uh, the, the organizer for, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, Pardon my uh, bad handwriting here. I got my uh, finger injured, so I could not uh, prepare better slides. <coughs> so, uh, basically, I'll be talking about Carolian conformal field theories and uh, classifying or rather constraining interactions when we have conformal symmetry, uh, Carolian conformal symmetries. Uh, you might have heard Oritro talking about uh, Carolian. Uh, physics a couple of days back uh, when he was talking about tensionless strings and uh, what uh, they are working on as I as far as I understand that tensionless strings have the world sheet uh, not as a uh, Riemann manifold rather a two dimensional uh, Carolian structure data. So uh, I will follow up looking at uh, Carolian physics for some time. Uh, the present one that I'm talking about uh, was in uh, uh, last year when my collaborators Kinjal, uh, two Adityas and Akhila. Uh, uh, I'll straight away uh, go to the main point. So this is for the appetizer. <coughs> we know uh, about, uh, so everything is known about uh, free field theories. They are integrable systems. Uh, the very well-known symmetries which uh, come from uh, space-time symmetries, <coughs> uh, for example, you have the concept uh, quantity, the Hamiltonian, uh, which uh, if, if you describe the theory, uh, the classically, you are equipped with the uh, Poisson structure as well, if you have a massive theory. So uh, here I'm, for simplicity, uh, talking about a scalar field theory, free scalar field theory. Yes. So uh, th these are the, uh, you know, uh, very well-known, well-understood, Mm, symmetries uh, when you have a free scalar field theory in a Minkowski space time. Uh, I uh, prefer to use this notation sometimes where xi is you know, a vector field on uh, the uh, covering phase space. And uh, sometimes, if, if you like to work, we won't be dealing much about boundary, boundary terms here, but if you have a, uh, a boundary interaction, it's sometimes convenient to work in terms of, uh, terms of the symplectic or the presymplectic structure rather than the Poisson, Poisson brackets. So basically this is the uh, same thing, but in a different notation, where is uh, Xi is a generator of Hamiltonian transformation on the phase space. And consequently uh, in free field theories, they, are, they give concept quantities as well, uh, where Hamiltonian is uh, here for this, uh, for this vector field Xi that's mentioned here. Uh, give rise to this uh, Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian in this case as well. Now there are uh, lesser known, these are known of course, uh, that's why free field theories are integrable, uh, but uh, not much interesting from various points of view, you do not, you cannot go on much uh, with those. For example, uh, as you might have seen here, we have A del del A uh, minus A star del del A star, if you just plug in any arbitrary function uh, of your momentum here, that also gives rise to Hamiltonian flows on phase space and gives, it gives rise to conserved quantities. <coughs> Basically, uh, if you write in terms of momentum space variables, this factor, the arbitrary factor, which is an arbitrary function, uh, gets into the Hamiltonian density. And for you choose a di different function and you get a new conserved. And these uh, flows uh, form an abelian algebra in the phase space. For the free field theory, you do not expect uh, uh, a central extension, and there comes up uh, as is evident from you. <coughs> you can work on this and construct newer and newer uh, conserved quantities this way. 
For example, you take arbitrary derivatives of A with respect to B plug and construct tensors here, in, in, introduce tensors here. Uh, uh, yes. And so if you insert tensors here, the thing is that you'll have to be a bit careful. There are some tracelessness and divergenceless conditions uh, that you impose on these tensors so that these quantities, uh, these vector fields really give rise to concept quantities on your phase space. Not only uh, they are uh, generators of canonical transformation. These actually are the infinite number of high spin symmetries responsible for uh, integrability of free field theories. Uh, and uh, I, I'll just exemplify uh, this for, uh, for newer excitations in the last decade, that uh, these include the BMS uh, algebra as well. For example, if you consider a three-dimensional field theory, for example, a scal scalar field theory, <coughs> you can construct, I did not write the uh, uh, generator of the transformations in the phase space, but uh, you, uh, it's easy to figure out, you can construct uh, super translation charges as well as the if, uh, two dimension of the, uh, the conformal transformations on the two dimension uh, spatial planes. Okay, but all this is uh, nice and fine. If you have a free field theory, you can do many things. Uh, that's not much of interest from a quantum, me uh, quantum mechanical perspective. Uh, but uh, <coughs> One may think of what happens in higher dimensions till date. We do not know of uh, so many large symmetries, uh, uh, even at the classical level, apart from very special case, like uh, N equals four super Yang is where you have hidden Yangian symmetries. Uh, uh, it, it's extremely hard to find anything more than Poincar in interacting uh, theories. Moreover, the, the symmetries that I have shown are uh, if, if, if you think about yang yans uh, in interacting theories like uh, uh, super yang is that I told, uh, or uh, of course, N equals six, uh, uh, Chan seven theory also has that. These symmetries uh, do not have in general geometrical or local action uh, in real space. These, these symmetries are hardly are local. Their action on the fields are hardly local. So it's uh, not quite straightforward to understand what uh, they generate, uh, the tr these transformations generate in terms of space time symmetries. But uh, we've been thinking of this for uh, quite a long time. Uh, and uh, we uh, have been giving away. So give, giving up uh, what happens if you give up uh, uh, relativistic symmetry and incorporate, let's say, uh, ultra uh, relativistic things. Uh, in uh, day before yesterday, most probably Rajesh, Rajesh Gupta have been talking about non-relativistic CFTs. <coughs> there are also uh, some interesting stuff happens that we also worked on that, that uh, you uh, get to have a large number of uh, geometric uh, space-time symmetries if you uh, uh, go to non-relativistic limits. Uh, we will go to uh, the other extreme, the ultra relativistic li limits, uh, which uh, is the uh, Carolian limit for uh, uh, if you start from the relativistic point of view. And we will see that you indeed can land up with a large number of global uh, uh, charges, large number of true symmetries of a theory if you go to the ultra, ultra relativistic limit. Okay. So this example is here. I'll just start up, at the, uh, then I'll go uh, into the, the other motivations be, uh, behind Carolian space time. So you start up this Lagrangian. I'm not talking about uh, talking in terms of Lagrangian densities. There's there are, uh, some technicalities there. So let's start with the Lagrangian in a, a three plus one dimensional space time. Uh, right now, I do not have manifest boundary uh, invariance. Actually, there is no boundary invariance at all where uh, we have uh, three fields, A, I, B, I. These are SO3 vectors and uh, B, T, which is a scalar. These, uh, this uh, Lagrangian, this is also, uh, this Lagrangian, this is an interacting Lagrangian. You, you will see you, it has B to the power fourth and B squared A, A. Uh, this Lagrangian has uh, infinite number of, uh, the symmetry algebra, is infinite dimensional, which is exemplified, for example, 
uh, if you uh, have a, a transformation like this, where f of x, x uh, are the spatial coordinates, uh, this acts on the scalar this way, one vector this way, which mixes uh, b i and b t, and the other transformation this way. Since f is an arbitrary function, this symmetry algebra is infinite dimension. This is abelian. This part is abelian, of course. Uh, what will I'll show uh, straight away is that this form forms the abelian uh, abelian ideal of an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, which we prefer to call as Carolian conformal Lie algebra. If you plug in f equals to one, that is your uh, well-known time translation. If you plug in for f as any one of the three coordinates, uh, uh, let's say uh, flat R three, the special part, what you get is Carroll boosts. Here we see that space and time do not have uh, equal footing. And for example, if you put f equals x square, you get temporal part of uh, special conformal transformation. Apart from this, there, there are a finite number of generators. You get spatial translation, which is the, the usual one. You have dilatation, scaling symmetry, and spatial part of spatial conformal transformation and spatial rotations. Yeah, in this case, since we are interested in three plus one dimensional theories, uh, this will be SO3. Uh, now, the, uh, the this part is infinite, as I've been telling you, that this forms an uh, abelian ideal of a larger algebra, and these are the finite parts of it. <coughs> we call it a uh, Carolian conformal algebra. Now, if we look at uh, the global or finite part of it, this has the, this SO5, which is composed of rotations, spatial translation, dilatations, and uh, special parts of uh, uh, special conformal transformation, they form the SO5. And if you uh, introduce these generators, which are parts of this, uh, if you wish, super translations, which are uh, spatial dependent uh, temporal transform uh, trans uh, transformations, which are special cases, the Hamiltonian and the uh, Carolian boost and uh, temporal part of the special conformal transformation. If you Plug in all of these, you, what you get is the ISO5. And if you have all of these uh, MFs, you get this infinite dimensional uh, Carolian conformal algebra. We have been uh, uh, looking at uh, free field realizations of these symmetries uh, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a couple of interacting theories as well, but now I will do uh, how do we get uh, to this uh, theory? We just just do not write write down some Lagrangian and uh, uh, see that okay. So we have uh, kind of made a systematics uh, for finding uh, searching for uh, Carolian conformal field theories. Uh, there's uh, some kinematical uh, tools as well as the dynamical ones. So this is the kinematics. Uh, we start with the space time, which is non-Riemannian. So if you wish, not a space time at all, which is equipped with a rank two covariant tensor which is degenerate of course and you have a vector field such that everywhere in the space time you uh, this uh, gives you the null directions i uh, kills of g in, in this sense and we define conformal isometries in a sense uh, this way that it preserves uh, you should be looking for vector fields which preserve g up to a uh, conformal factor and which as well preserve this vector field this this is a special vector field up to a conformal factor. The choice of uh, yeah, the ratio between two conformal factors is yours. And uh, we have chosen it to be minus two uh, for reasons, uh, because we can then find free field realizations of these symmetries. I'm not very sure of, of if you choose any other integers uh, and whether non-integers are allowed as well. Uh, but for our purpose, we will stick to this ratio of minus two. And uh, since uh, we are interested in simplest of physics, we choose a flat Carroll structure. That means we choose uh, a metric, which is flat in special directions. And we choose the special vector field, which is in the time direction. And it, it can easily solve these differential equations to give you uh, the solutions. Now in the solutions, the arbitrariness is there in terms of a function. So basically that, uh, that tells you that you have an infinite choice of vector fields, 
uh, these all of the other coefficients omega pi delta ki these are constants that means uh, the other parts give you a finite uh, number of generators but due to this part which forms an abelian ideal of the algebra gives you an infinite number of generators uh, duval hobarty and gibbons have been uh, talking about these structures for uh, quite uh, more than a decade and they have interestingly showed that uh, Carroll structures actually reduce to BMS algebra, which is the asymptotic symmetry algebra of asymptotic class space times in appropriate uh, dimensions. For example, if you are uh, uh, working in, if you are working in four-dimensional bulk uh, and you wish to call BMS four the asymptotic uh, symmetry algebra, which has the super translations. <coughs> as well as the global uh, conformal symmetries of the two sphere, you get everything uh, packaged here. A uh, uh, similar thing ha happens if you are interested in uh, three-dimensional asymptotic flash space time. Uh, the only thing is that in those special cases, for example, if you are in four-dimensional bulk, uh, the S2 has uh, not globally uh, defined, but uh, infinite dimensional conformal symmetry uh, of the S2. For that, solving these differential equations needs a bit of special care. You get the Virazoro as well, so the super, the super rotations as well as the super translations. As a similar thing happens if you are in three dimensions. But uh, we are talking, about, we are right now not focusing exactly on uh, 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 hologra uh, so uh, a prescription of celestial holography or holography right now, we are dealing with a uh, very uh, simple-minded analysis of a field theory in four-dimensional space-time where our spatial slices are flat. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the, uh, to see how these transformations, these uh, diffeomorphisms are connected to uh, theory on Carroll manifold, we need to see how uh, they act on fields. Now, this is a bit uh, non, not, not so straightforward because uh, we wish not to work with tensors on uh, Carroll manifolds. We have something uh, different in plan because we want to uh, see operators we have, which have specific dilatation symmetry and which transforms uh, nicely under uh, the spatial rotations. Uh, in that sense. So, uh, so that requires a little bit of work on the representation theory and I'm, I'll not detail what's written here. Basically, the, all the generators, how the generators act on the fields. Uh, I have not written transformations for arbitrary uh, rank tensors. Uh, we are now uh, yeah, <clears throat> pleased with what we have for scalars and vector vectors uh, and not higher spin fields right now because we uh, we are trying to mimic something like gauge theories uh, with the spins not greater than one in three plus one dimension. That's why we are limiting ourselves to scalars and vectors. Now, uh, so uh, from the dynamical perspective, we start from the understanding that Carroll physics is basically, if you just blindly think of Carroll physics, is the ultra relativistic limit of relativistic physics. Uh, in one way, you can think c, uh, c goes to zero. Uh, the is, uh, and if you start with, uh, for example, uh, a Minkowski space time and a photon field, uh, gauge field uh, mu, uh, the following limits uh, uh, are there, which is a magnetic, and which another is the electric limit. Uh, there are reasons, for example, if you start with Maxwell's electrodynamics, you go to use the first limit, you go to uh, uh, you use the Maxwell's equations and you get equations which have magnetic fields dominant and in the second case you, you get the electric fields dominant. So epsilon is a small number after doing all your analysis you keep uh, you know the uh, predominant powers of epsilon and see what happens there. This is uh, the zeroth order way to understand this. Funny enough so if you uh, start with Yes. Five more minutes. Uh, you have five more minutes. Yeah, it's fine. So, <clears throat> funnily enough, uh, if you use the magnetic limit on this equation, you get uh, you lose the uh, scalar part of your four-vector four potential, 
and you get these equations and this is in a sense meaningless two equations for ai and hence they cannot come from a, from an action principle unless you have some other fields you don't have an action uh, <coughs> moreover these uh, so we uh, thought about this, these equations earlier these have current symmetries but only weakly. That means that if, if T is your equation of motion and star is a generator of a symmetry, and uh, if you uh, do the variation uh, and it, uh, so the, the equation remains infinite only on shape, we call that uh, weak invariance. Rather, there's a version which is a strong invariance. This says like this, if you have a number of equations of motion, uh, which are coming from where in the, if for example, if you have an action and you, uh, if TK is the uh, equation of motion corresponding to the phi, uh, field phi K, uh, this condition is what is known as strong invariance. So uh, th there's a little subtlety that weak, in, weak symmetries are, or weak invariance are always has to be taken uh, with a grain of salt because in uh, cases more, uh, more often than not, Weak symmetries are not often true symmetries uh, because they are in many cases are not symmetries of the action. You can check, for example, if you take a, a complex scalar field and you uh, do, uh, you know, you want uh, you do a transformation where your parameter is a complex, not uh, it to the power i lambda, but it has a real part as well. Uh, uh, your uh, equations of motion are uh, invariant, but your action is not. So, in this, uh, uh, those uh, those symmetries are uh, not true symmetries in that sense. Now, what we do in uh, is that uh, we introduce new degrees of freedom. So, since we uh, landed up with equations of motion which uh, cannot come from actions, we introduce new degrees of freedom and see uh, if we really can construct. Uh, a consistency, a consistent theory or an action. So this is known as a Helmholtz criteria, integral, integrality criteria. If you have a set of differential equations, uh, then uh, Helmholtz criteria says that these can, there's a set of conditions, I'm not exactly going into the details, but uh, say that if these conditions are met, then it's guaranteed that these equations come from a variational principle. So we, uh, you introduce newer fields in the system, uh, check for Helmholtz criteria and check at every step whether conformal Carroll, this infinite dimensional symmetry is intact on. Uh, this is a, a very rough cartoon uh, check, the way we check. We start with an equation of motion, we pass it through Helmholtz criteria. If satisfied, fine, go and uh, check full Carroll symmetry. If no, then add SO3 tensor. Basically, in this case, we try first by adding scalars and vectors uh, sec uh, at second order derivatives, since right now it is at the tree level, uh, such, and, uh, such that we get back uh, in, in a way that we had started with the limiting equations of motion, in a way that if we turn off those extra fields, we really get back uh, the uh, limiting equations of motion that we started off it. So this uh, this is iteration uh, is a self-consistent algorithm and in most of the cases where we did not have equations of motion we can succeed in uh, finding a symmetric equation of motion with one or two iterations it converges if not that means uh, you'll have to try with higher rank tensors. Okay so uh, <laughs> For, for the present case, uh, if we started off with Maxwell's electrodynamics, we only had uh, the AI, the spatial uh, part of the vector potential. And uh, in this case, we had to add one scalar and one vector, which gave us a, uh, uh, and the consistency check passed through and gave us this uh, set of three equations. Uh, and that which can uh, come from a Lagrange, which has a Carroll symmetry as well. We have an undetermined constant here, which can be fixed uh, as per your choice. Now, the thing is that we wanted to see, look, uh, so we started from a relativistic theory, we uh, got up to an action which is inconsistent, we added newer degrees of freedom, which 
which is consistent in terms of a variation principle. Now we were trying to see if there is a relativistic parent from which uh, this, uh, this new theory with uh, the new fields can descend. Uh, we started off with a theory of two vector fields, but uh, funnily enough, we did not find any such. Uh, so, so maybe it does not have a relativistic parent or if there is, uh, so you'll have to engage fix some part of it. Uh, that, that part is not clear to us, but the zero third guess did not work. And about interactions, uh, we added all possible quartics since we wanted to keep scale invariance. Uh, for conformal Carroll Carol invariance. Only a couple of deformations were allowed. So this is uh, one is bt to the power four, another is bt squared and uh, the vector, uh, vector potential squared. These two deformations were allowed. So this is uh, uh, the, you know, the minimum, uh, the Carol, conformal Carroll invariant theory that starts from a magnetic limit of Maxwell's electrodynamics. And if you want to incorporate interactions, you can incorporate interactions without thinking of gauge anymore because anyway, uh, these equations did not have gauge redundancy anymore. So we have lost that case. Uh, so we also try to uh, uh, restrict uh, two point functions based on global symmetries alone. Uh, most of the uh, two point functions do vanish uh, apart from a couple of two. This uh, may be compared interestingly with what happens uh, with ordinary electrodynamics. For example, if you have uh, two uh, correlations, uh, photon, prop uh, photon propagators, but uh, you know, situated at two, two fields situated at uh, causally disconnected, uh, causally not connected points, you, you get actually similar kind of forms of uh, two point functions. Uh, if you so this matches up uh, you know, to that case if you make a proper choice of gauge, gauge. so the xi parameter if you choose you know r gauge or uh, uh, you keep a parameter of xi which you know, parameterizes your gauge uh, these uh, two point functions uh, are nice when you take the uh, carol limit this can be understood in a way that so in the left panel you i and give three points A, B, and C. If you are in Minkowski, uh, A, B are causally disconnected and C is causally connected with A. However, if you take Carroll uh, limit, your light cone converges to a single line. Uh, so it basically shrinks and all points are causally disconnected. Uh, even uh, so, if they are at specially separated points. Two, uh, two points are causally connected if uh, they are at exactly the same spatial location. So, in that sense, uh, if, if you start off with different x1 and x2, uh, you always have causally disconnected uh, points. So, that uh, therefore, in, in order to check, uh, uh, so even three level two point functions, uh, you have to think about uh, two different branches. Uh, one is if they are located at exactly same point that requires special care. Most in most cases we have seen that if you start off with exactly same points, there is uh, uh, contact terms in terms of delta functions or derivatives of, of delta functions, which have dif uh, different significance. If you, for example, consider three-dimensional Carolian field theories. Uh, which may be believed to uh, related to celestial holography. There are also, you see, you come across contact terms into point functions. Uh, we are working on something on that and try to see if starting from a Carroll field theory, you can see those contact terms appearing. Uh, and uh, so the, 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 this thing that I uh, mentioned already earlier, uh, does our interacting Carroll theory have a relativistic parent? It seems no, for example. So this uh, diagram does not come. You, you start with a Lorentz invariant action and you take ultra relativistic limit, you get a Carroll action. This is one route. The other route is you uh, start with Lorentz covariant equations of motion, you take ultra relativistic limit. So uh, this Carroll action does not always correspond to Carroll invariant equations of motion. 
Yes, uh, and about what what are the other things that uh, I, I'm thinking and in this line is right now. So you have this infinite number of symmetries, you have an exact action. Uh, you must be curious whether this uh, large, large number of symmetries are however they spontaneously broken or not. And uh, whether if you develop uh, anomaly uh, for those super translations, if you do, uh, do a one loop uh, calculation with these interactions, uh, I, uh, that might, might be uh, something interesting uh, in terms of the way we understand uh, Carroll physics or even uh, uh, physics described by celestial holography. Uh, that's all I had to tell uh, now. Thank you for your attention. I'll stop. Uh, thank you, Rudranil, for this nice talk. Uh, are there questions? We can take only two or three short questions. Uh, I can see here, Agniva, uh, do you have a question here? I see a raised hand. Yeah, so a uh, small question. Uh, basically, where Rudruda wrote the metric, it seems that the special part is the delta ij dxi uh, tensor product dxj. Right. So I fail to see how this is a non-degenerate metric. Uh, like a... this is this, this is a degenerate metric. Yeah. So I, I fail to see how how right. I mean, it's just uh, okay. delta ij along so, the. So, so basically, you are in four dimensions, let's say, and your i and j runs from one to three. Right. That's why you do not have one component. So if you write the matrix, you have uh, uh, one zero in the diagonal and. Uh, oh, okay, 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 okay. And another thing is in this space, in this well, the physics is it easy to introduce spinners? Because they, I mean, there I don't seem to see any SL2C kind of uh, uh, transformation on anything here. So if you start from the representation, it's hard to get uh, how uh, you would introduce spinners. I have collaborators who are working on that right now. Uh, but if you start directly from, you know, uh, Dirac spinners, you can land up with this prescription, prescription of spinners, which have a transformation, uh, have their own transformation properties and the Carol, uh, Carol boost. That's the most non-trivial part that is different from your uh, Poincaré invariant phase. Uh, but if you uh, really want to do, uh, find a spinorial representation, that's non-trivial. And uh, uh, my collaborators are working on it. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? Okay. If not, let's thank Rudranil Basu for a very nice talk.